back now at 56 pass. I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard it. Around I'd never heard it said. About, I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, I heard around big or about. in the lunchroom the See? week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC. GE com. I mean, well, what Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. With, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a in computer the dictionary. billboard. It's not, it's, it's not in it. It's it, it's it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide, right. and it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right, and others can access it. And, right, and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Just it came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie, and I was but you don't need you don't need that you don't need a phone line to operate no. internet. No. Connectivity. We wonder if 50 years ago anyone imagined an America where we spend so much time on screens, as much as 12 hours a day, including TV. The first electronic connector was Samuel Morse. His message across a telegraph line in 1866, What hath God wrought? What indeed? We live in very dangerous times. We live during a time period that is led and controlled by wolves, ravenous wolves that hide in darkness, that devour their prey in secret. It's only secret because they don't like revealing themselves. <laughs> Maybe that's too heavy to start this video with. Let's forget about the wolves for a second and talk about their prey, which is us. We are prey and most don't even know it. You know, we can speak about the different conspiracies and those groups like the Illuminati, all we want. But for most people, that information doesn't really provide much understanding in order for us to stop being prey of these wolves. The problem is that while many of us may know the end goal and where this world is leading to, for instance, knowing we are being led into a new world order, if you have followed this channel, you should understand what that means. But as I was saying, while we understand where the world is going, we don't really understand how it is that we are getting there. In this series of Breaking Out of the Matrix, we have spoken about major themes, like who controls us through the power of their wealth and shadow banking, how we are controlled through education, and the illusion of a democracy. And we have spoken about the history of modern medicine. But this topic is extremely important because it is probably one of the biggest tools of control, yet it is not understood in the very least. Do you know what we all are? We are consumers. We consume. I'm not talking about it in a retail aspect, but that is also very true. I'm speaking about us as a mass population. If we are not in the position of power and control in this world, we are in the other position, which is to consume. There are people at the top of the food chain in our society that create these products and we just consume them. We are like Pac-Man, just eating and consuming all day long. But we never get to the power pellets that give us the power to consume those who are actually coming after us. I don't know if that makes sense. Let me come at it from another direction. We live our lives consuming. We consume what it is that they give us to eat. And for the most part, we don't know much about it, except that we like the taste. For instance, with our food, much of our food today is made in labs. We eat a bunch of chemistry experiments. Much of our meat is cloned and genetically engineered. Much of the food on the shelves is not food at all, but just results of chemistry. Now, there's not much we can do about the meat except try to eat organic, but who really knows what organic means today anyway, and who can really afford it? But in much of our other packaged foods, the food on the shelves, most of us eat it based on the price and the marketing of it. But we don't know what we're really consuming. 
Look at the ingredients on this. Those are all chemicals. Many of us eat this every day, but don't really know what we're eating. We just consume. Another example is with the television. Since the early generations were given the television, we have just been consumers of it. We consume it, but don't understand the technology. We don't understand how after less than a minute, the television places us in a hypnotic state. We don't understand that the whole purpose of the television was used to program us. I mean, they don't even hide it. They call it television programs. Think about how deep it is when we stare at the screen for hours and days, weeks, years, decades, and we just allow ourselves to be programmed. We even get upset when they interrupt it. Think about that message. We're sorry to have to interrupt your regularly scheduled program. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. When you think about how much of zombies we have to be to just sit around and wait for our dose of routine programming, it's really crazy and sickening. But we don't recognize what we're doing because we are just consumers. We consume. And because of this behavior of consuming things we don't understand, we can be sheep led to slaughter for the wolves. Now, all of that was pretty deep, and I hope it at least got you thinking. But let me move on to my point. Do you know what the world consumes the most right now of, yet we know very little about it? Now, I mean, if you looked at the title of the video, you know the answer, so it's more rhetorical. The internet is probably the biggest product ever created by the wolves. They created it and distributed it to us, never really explaining how it works and its capabilities. And then to hook us in deeper, they made other products to help us consume the internet even more. Until we're at a point in time where we don't even recognize that the internet itself is a product. We are so addicted and controlled by it that we couldn't even imagine a life without it. Think about how when your internet service goes down for a second, it seems like nothing else works. This product of the internet is being used and developed to bring us into a completely new world. There is no new world order without the internet. But today, those opposed to the new world order probably couldn't live a life without the internet. It would be hard. Now listen, I'm not making a message right now telling everyone to get off the internet. But for believers, I want you to know that there is a time coming where you will have to. The internet is a product that was made in order to implement the new world order. It made the world small enough to control. And in the end, it will lead to the system of the mark of the beast. There are agendas that are happening right now that are in place that many of us don't see because we don't understand their plans. For instance, did you know that they're planning on changing the internet? What I mean is pushing out a new version of the web, Web 3.0. Yeah, they are. Now, I know you probably heard about the metaverse. I mean, I made a video about it on this channel. You know about cryptocurrencies, but do you really understand what they were created for? I have also made a couple videos about that, even explaining it very clearly that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies will be tied to the mark of the beast. All of these tools are out there, but they are all puzzle pieces. And if you put them all together, you can see the big picture. In order to really understand where we are all headed, you must understand what connects all these pieces together. You must have a foundation in the tool that we are all being used and controlled by. You must understand the internet, the history of it, how it is now, and what the future of it will be. Let's begin. Okay, so again, it's important to look at the internet as a product, not just as a utility or a resource. It is a product. And with any product, it is created by someone or some organization and that it is sold to its consumers. Just like with most products, we are sold all the benefits and rarely know or understand what's under the hood. I recently started digging deeper into this product of the internet more after I realized that the expiration date on my usage of certain tools of the internet will be sooner than I thought. You see, my iPhone was acting up a little and it has been going slower and I thought it was because it's an older model. I'm on an iPhone 10, so it's not picking up the 5G networks. And I thought to myself, let me get the 11 Max 
before that's not available anymore. But I was too late. I went to Apple and I tried to get the 11 Max, but they said they don't carry that anymore. I couldn't find it anywhere. I mean, they had the smaller version, but they stopped making the Max version. I found that they are not making any more devices that are not compatible with 5G. Phones, iPads, computers, nothing. And I am completely opposed to 5G. I made a video about this that YouTube deleted. If you want to understand why, the video is on my personal website. Anyways, I realized that there is a limit to my usage of this technology because they are not giving us a choice. Either you accept 5G or you're left behind. And so shortly after this understanding, I started looking more into the future of the internet. I guess I heard CNBC speak on Web3 and one of my friends spoke about it around the same time. You see, I always heard of Web3 but never took the time to really understand it. So I decided to take a bigger leap of understanding into our technology. And after all the research, it led me to make this video. That's the backstory. Now listen, let's be clear. I am not here and making these videos to make anyone's decisions for them. You can agree or disagree. I simply believe in knowledge and understanding. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I believe that wholeheartedly. So I am simply led to educate people on topics that have not been properly taught, if they are even being taught at all. We should not just consume without knowing what it is we are consuming. This way we have more control over it rather than it having control over us. And that is the proper segue into understanding where the topic of this video is going. This was a long setup, I know, but I needed to properly lay a foundation. So let's discuss the internet. Now, we can't talk about the future of the internet without understanding the past. Now, I'm not a tech guy, and my understanding is a very simple one. So I will not be using a lot of their jargon, and I won't be as technical as some who really understand this topic might prefer. A minute or two ago, I spoke about Web3, which is the third version of the internet. I'm not sure that it was common knowledge that there are three versions of the internet. I know I didn't know. So to understand the third version, we need to first understand versions 1 and 2. So version 1 of the internet. This is the internet from the time period of let's say 1991 to 2004. In the past, the internet was mostly just a bunch of web pages. They were read only. You go to a page, click a link, and you get information. They call that static pages. There wasn't a lot of interaction with the web pages. You didn't log on to websites. You couldn't write on the pages itself, leave comments, for instance. It was like a big Wikipedia with different links that took you all over the web. Like I said, though, they were read only. This early version of the Internet wasn't even profitable by ads. Viewing analytics was not a part of this version. The average Web 1 user was limited to sending emails and reading information published on web pages. But at the time, you must understand that this was revolutionary. When we were first using it, it was very cool. Now, in understanding this, it is important to understand behind the scenes. When discussing Web 1, we are talking about a time period from the 90s. But the Internet has been around for a longer period of time than that. It is said that the origins of the Internet could be traced all the way back to 1966, when the United States Department of Defense began working on a project known as ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. And what has been said is that they set out to create a system for remote computer access and communication, simply meaning computers communicating with other computers. This was a decentralized system. When the internet was first created, it was decentralized. Now, let me cover this word because it's important to understand and you're going to hear it often. Decentralized means controlled by several local offices or authorities rather than one single one. When you hear the word decentralized, this word is about control, where the control is. When something is said to be decentralized, it's not in the power of just one person or one organization, but in the control of multiple groups. Centralized is the opposite. It's about one organization, one person controlling it. Remember this. So again, the early internet was more peer-to-peer, computer-to-computer. 
the speed and capabilities were based on the computers that were used in the network. This was fine when the network was small, but as the adoption of the internet grew, this way became unmanageable. So when Web1 was introduced, it came with a different system than when the internet was first invented. Again, the first internet was more of an intranet. All the computers in the one network worked together and communicated with each other. Very much like in your job, they have an intranet where all the corporation's computers talk with each other. When Web1 was introduced, it came with new protocols that allowed it to be the World Wide Web. The first website ever created on the internet was created at CERN in Switzerland. And this should tell us all that we need to know about the foundation of it. But in regards to the internet at its creation, the first part to know is that it was no longer decentralized, but now centralized. Power or ownership of the internet was placed in the hands of one group. The DNS or domain name system was created to handle the naming and routing of web addresses. You see, in order to create your own website, you have to go through them. That is true to this day. The DNS and their parent organization, ICANN, they basically own most of the websites that we use. ICANN stands for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It is the organization that controlled the internet. Like I was saying about our own websites, we don't own them. We rent them. We rent our domain names from registrars like GoDaddy and Namecheap who are authorized by ICANN to rent them. GoDaddy and Namecheap and other places like that, they are the middlemen. So at the end of the day, we don't actually take ownership of these domains. This is why it is possible for websites to be censored, transferred, and seized entirely. And this is the foundation for understanding Web1. Web1 was an internet that was read-only, that's control was centralized. The ownership and control of Web1 is through one organization. All of us consumers just dealt with the middlemen. Now we move on to Web 2.0, Web 2. This is the internet that we are currently using right now. This was from 2004 to our current time. Web 2 is the read and write web. This version of the internet became more interactive. This version gave users the ability to contribute to websites by writing their own content. Web 2 took the static content of Web 1 days and made it dynamic. So now, websites were not just static, but they can now be dynamic, which means you can interact with them and write on them. We were able to give these dynamic web pages information. For instance, like when we add a comment to a page. That's because the page is dynamic. If it was static, you could not do that. Now, here's the biggest part to all this. Not only were we able to give these web pages information, but now the web pages were able to now get information from us. The flow of information was now a two way street. Now, with this version of the web, it was now at this point transferring enormous amounts of information about each of us all over the world who used it. Web 2.0 is where we saw the creation of social networking. People were creating new products on this major product of the internet. And the products were all about increasing our level of interaction with the internet. And it became that the better your website was able to keep people engaged and keep people interacting with your site, the more valuable your site was. It was because of attention. The more attention a site was able to hold, the better. Why is that? It's because of the same business model that television is based from. You monetize attention through ads. And so with Web 2.0, a major shift happened in the world that was deeper than the television could ever provide. Web 2.0 transformed us into a product. We became data that was able to be studied, monitored, and monetized. As we interacted on Facebook, did Google searches, watched YouTube videos, these centralized companies were now able to gather data about us so that they could serve us better content so that can keep us engaged, so we would then stay on their websites longer. They were collecting a massive amount of data about everyone that engaged in their products. Then they took it a step deeper and took all of that massive amount of data that they were collecting and then packaged it to sell to advertisers, which created the age of targeted advertising 
and the lack of privacy for all of us consumers who just consume the internet blindly. To better understand, let's look at it from examining the company Facebook, now renaming themselves Meta because of Web3, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's say you go and open up a new Facebook account. You enter your name, your age, your phone number, maybe your gender. Then you connect with some friends, join a few groups that you're interested in, and like the pages of some of your favorite brands. Just like that, you have given Facebook a virtual version of yourself. And with the power of AI, this virtual version of you is constantly being updated as you interact with the platform. Every click, like, and swipe is recorded and used to learn more about you. It stays on even when you're off of Facebook so that all the cookies interact with Facebook and it knows what you're looking at, what you're, the sites that you're on, everything about you. And from all this, it tailors the content that you see. So you and I could log on to Facebook or YouTube and never see the same content. We have virtual identities. Our virtual identity is built out by algorithms and sold to the highest bidder. Now, Facebook has billions of these virtual identities, and they own a massive amount of data that it rents out to advertisers and government agencies. Don't be naive here. Government agencies like the NSA in the United States have back doors to these sites that they're able to access this data and profile us. Now, Facebook does not necessarily sell the data. Instead, they use this data to create highly accurate models, which marketers then target with ads. And this is how the internet works. That's the business model, in a nutshell. I'm sure you understand this by now, but it's worth stating the obvious. Everything you do on the internet is tracked, monitored, and recorded. I remember when they first came out and told us this. They allowed that whole Edward Snowden leak to come out to see just how little we cared about it. The NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them for periods of time. They told us we were being monitored and we just kept using it. We didn't care. And so they continued on with their agenda. To help with the tracking and monitoring, they created products like smartphones and other smart devices that just add to the collection of data. Anything that is called smart is a data collecting device. They harvest our data and use it to sell ads back to us and to know and understand the population. This has become the primary business model of Web 2.0. Advertisements are the lifeblood of today's web. And I think we all knew that. So the thing is that as we started using all these devices that are collecting and recording data, our personal lives are now just logged as data. Everything we do is collected and we do not own this data about ourselves. Just like with domain names and our digital content, our online identity is owned by the platform, not you. So that online identity, it can be censored and seized. And they have been displaying just how true this is last year when they kicked the US president off these major social media platforms. So understand, the content that is on our feeds when we look at platforms like Facebook or Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, etc., that content that we see in our feeds is from information that we know that we gave these companies by our likes, by commenting, how long you looked at a video, if you shared it. That is all data that is collected, sorted through, and it helps these companies provide us content. But the ads that we receive are from information that you didn't know that you give them. Understand, when you went to Chick-fil-A for lunch, they knew that. When you get to work every day at 9 a.m., they know that. But like I saw on another video, they said machine learning started showing a guy some parenting ads because they knew he was going to be a father before he even knew. And there were so many ways they could have known. For instance, if his girlfriend, which they already would have known was his girlfriend, if she using the same Wi-Fi and searched to understand about her symptoms, then it would know that she was pregnant. And the machine learning algorithm probably already knew she was ovulating because most women today put their cycles on an app so they can keep track of it. What I'm trying to say is that they know more about our lives than we probably know. And that is the internet in a very quick explanation. That's Web 2.0, the version of the internet that we're in today. We have massive amounts of our own personal data in the hands of centralized companies and governments. 
we do not own or control our information in Web 2.0. So here comes the bait and switch. When understanding where we're going, you need to understand there is one major piece of mind control that many people seem to fall for. I believe that it's possible because people don't truly understand the true control structure of this world and don't understand the ravenous wolves that I spoke of earlier. They know the world is changing, but they also believe that the change that is coming is all about handing control over back to the people. So before I explain Web 3.0, I need to explain this mind control that has been given out. When I hear people speak like this, I don't know if they're just being sinister or if they actually believe this story themselves, but it really doesn't matter. The future is being framed in a way of decentralizing the world, giving power back to the people. Basically, people believing that Web 3.0, the metaverse, and cryptocurrencies are tools to bring power to the people so that we are not controlled by corporations and governments. They believe that the world will be decentralized and the power will go back to the people. You know that phrase, power to the people. That's what these people believe. Right on, my brother, power to the people. <laughs> the people excited about cryptocurrencies, about NFTs, the metaverse, and Web3, they believe that this new change coming to the world will be about bringing equality and fairness to the world. So they are all super hyped about this coming future. This mind control is just another version of the vision that they try to sell us with the idea of democracy. But if you watched the Matrix video about voting, you'd understand how naive that way of thought was. So understanding, these people believe that we are moving to a much fairer, more just world, and that these new technologies of Web3, the metaverse, and cryptocurrencies are all about building that new world. These technologies are sold to the people to help them believe in the vision of this coming new world order, that this new world will be fair and just and for the people. Now, if you understand how I feel about the New World Order, you would know quickly that I do not share in any of that programming or beliefs. I know that it is absolutely a ridiculous thought to believe power is going back to the people. Power is always held in the hands of a small few. The only power that they give out is the power of illusion. They give out the illusion of freedom. And if you really understand this world, after the massive amount of control that they have now, they can build these structures that make people believe they have power when they are actually a slave. That's the Matrix, by the way. That's why this video is in the series Breaking Out of the Matrix. Anyways, the fact is that in the system that they have created, they have amassed so much power that they don't need the same power structures that they built before. And they can control people more directly without the need of a lot of the red tape that is now present. They want a one world government and a one world currency. And for the one world government to be formed, they need to remove the barriers. And that is what these new technologies are doing for them. So we are moving to change the whole system and the whole way everything works, which is why this news about Elon Musk and Twitter is so heavily reported. Everything you hear about Elon Musk is about bringing up the future in just a way that brings people's attention to it. Elon Musk is bringing up the discussion about the changes that they are planning to bring aboard. Instead of focusing on the drama that they promote when they're speaking about him, focus on the future that they're talking about. Also understanding this is thinking about Apple, how over the last few years, they made such a turn towards speaking about privacy. They're displaying it often to us. So now they're showing us the information that we give to apps and we choose if we want to allow them or not. The next sale is a digital treasure trove charming Ellie's private data. Lot number one, her emails. The one she's opened and read, wonderfully personal. Let's start at 240, 260, 280. Sold. Lot number two, Ellie's drugstore purchases. Voila, priceless data. Do I hear 480? 500. Sold. Her location data. It's not creepy, it's commerce. Do I hear 600, 620, 640, 660? Sold. Nana? All her contacts, even sweet Nana. So, at 7.40, her recent transactions, her browsing history, her late-night texting habit. Sold! And now the one you've all been waiting for, and I can promise you won't be disappointed. Oh. Have you noticed when you go to websites now, they're always asking about cookies? It's because the laws are demanding that they tell us that they are tracking us, and then we consent to it. Facebook, 
one of the most powerful companies in the world, did not just change its name to Meta because they made an unwise bet on the future. They know the future because they are the future. Through their collection of data, they have been one of the companies reshaping the future. And this will all be done through the implementation of the new version of the web, Web 3.0. So we need to understand it more. When you read of Web 3.0, the majority sell it as this great thing, like I explained earlier. They say it's a movement to reclaim the internet. It isn't one single technology or advancement, but it is a complete rethinking of how the web should work. Web 3 is said to be decentralizing the web once again and redistributing control and data ownership back to its users. They say we are taking back our digital identities and regaining our freedom. This is truly what those that know about Web3, what they believe. And besides them, there's the rest of the public that doesn't know a thing about it, but are just waiting to be herded in by default. And that's why I'm bringing it up to you in this video. Web3.0 is the next evolution of the internet. It will be utilizing blockchain technology and tools of decentralization like cryptocurrencies. As I explained earlier, in our current version of the internet, Web 2.0, we are the products as we browse social networks and interact online. But in Web 3.0, it is framed that we will now be the owner of our content, the stuff that we post online. You have full control of your data. If you go back to when we spoke about the metaverse, when Mark Zuckerberg displayed it in his presentation about it, he owned rooms and having his NFTs and other items. The world, the economy, everything changes and it'll be all about your value online. When we look back at Web 1 and Web 2, we know there are middlemen. Facebook is the middleman for community. YouTube, the middleman for content distribution. This is very much like in our finance system, our banks are just middlemen for financial transactions. The primary role of a middleman is to facilitate trust. But the more we rely on these middlemen, the more control we have given them and more dependence we have on them. Web3 has been dubbed the Read, Write, Trust Web. With Web3, in order to develop trust, it will use the technology of blockchain. Now, blockchain it's a decentralized, distributed, immutable ledger. You're probably like, what? Let me explain. Essentially, it is a secure way to record and keep track of information without the use of one central authority. Blockchain is decentralized, again, meaning it has no centralized owner or manager. Instead, it is managed and maintained by its entire network of users. It cannot be controlled by one government corporation or anyone so they say with no single entity in charge blockchain allows its users to add and verify transactions and information themselves blockchains are peer-to-peer -peer networks governed by their users blockchain is immutable meaning unable to be changed once a transaction is verified by the network it is added to the blockchain on what is called a block it creates a block and once a transaction is added to the blockchain, it's permanent. It cannot be changed. Users store copies of the blockchain on their own devices, effectively backing up its content in thousands of places in real time. So basically, everything that we do online will be able to be tracked, recorded, and can never be changed or removed. And then it's said to be secure using cryptography. Blockchain utilizes cryptography for the encryption and decryption of information. Cryptography is, it's complicated, and maybe I can explain it at another time. But very quickly, it's just a way of encrypting information until it gets to the person it is designed to get to, and then it is decrypted. In the future of the world, everything becomes digital. In this new system, every movement, every word, everything done is logged, tracked, and through blockchain, and is permanent. And because our lives are so dependent on the web and everything that we do is monitored already in the web, they know when we wake up, when we go to work, what we look at, what we eat, what we buy, everything that we do, who you talk to, your friends, what you like, everything you do is tracked and monitored. And so what happens is that everything that you do in your life will be tracked, logged, recorded, and it can never be changed. So this system that they're talking about with freedom will be the most knowing system ever created. Even if you did something that skipped them, they could always go back and figure out everything that you've done. And though everything may be decentralized, 
if understanding and interpreting and even receiving the data is in the hands of a small few, then that power is already sourced. But let's keep going. The next tool that will be used in Web3 to help with the trust is cryptocurrencies. You see, they can talk all day long today about cryptocurrencies and their volatility. It's only because the people that are talking about this don't understand the technologies and the future. They're only looking at it as a currency that's tied to fiat currencies, when that has nothing to do with what cryptocurrencies were created for. If you understood the future, you would know that cryptocurrencies aren't going anywhere. When I first heard of cryptocurrencies back in 2012, I believe, I was completely confident of its future and its acceptance. I think it was around $200 at the time. I was certain, not because of a belief in decentralization. I mean, if that was the first thing I ever heard about, I probably would have written it off, to be honest. Because as I've said, I don't believe in a decentralized world. But anyways, I was confident of Bitcoin because I believe in the Bible and have been looking for the implementation of the Mark of the Beast. And once I read about Bitcoin, I knew that this technology was it. This technology is what is going to be used to implement the system for the Mark of the Beast. But let me slow down. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself here. Cryptocurrencies in general will be used in Web3 to build trust. Cryptocurrencies are the incentive mechanisms behind Web3. Instead of using ads to power everything, cryptocurrencies are able to align the incentives of creators and users. Instead of passively using a network that is funded by someone else, blockchain networks are able to reward users directly, giving them good reason to support the network themselves. Web2 chooses to extract value from users. Web3 is able to redistribute value directly back to its users with coins and tokens. It is a complete new world and economy. It is a completely new way of doing things, so it may be hard to understand and imagine at this point that we're in. Users are given tokens for participating on the web, which can be used then to vote on decisions regarding how a platform should change or improve, or demand what features we want to be offered. These tokens could even accrue real value and build wealth. What is happening with Twitter is the most public example of what they are speaking of. They just use a bunch of keywords when explaining it. For example, they say a Web3 version of Twitter could give more users control over their post and make verifying identities easier. And when using Twitter, they say cryptocurrencies will play a key role. Remember, Elon Musk is absolutely obsessed with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And the founder of Twitter, who no longer owns the company, but still, Jack Dorsey, he is all in on Bitcoin as well. It's because they understand the future. So back to the internet, I believe the internet will have a native currency. So a Twitter Web3 application that runs on a certain blockchain, let's say Ethereum. Ethereum is a type of blockchain. It's much more than just a cryptocurrency. But a Twitter Web3 application that runs on a certain blockchain that uses a specific digital coin or token, let's say Twitter coin, the more you use Twitter, the more you will be able to obtain these coins or tokens. And those tokens will be able to transact in the new economy somehow. There are different coins popping up from different companies. For instance, Pepcoin from Pepsi. I mean, you'll see them everywhere. In Web 3.0, Experts say we will reach the point of the internet where every company is ran by a decentralized group called a DAO, or maybe DAO, I'm not sure how they say it, but it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. This is an organization run by code, agreed upon by the people who started the DAO. This is facilitated through smart contracts, which I cannot explain in this video. Our whole world and economy will run off these smart contracts. It's a new way of running companies, and this will work with climate change agendas as well. There's just too much to mention in this video, but please understand the climate change agenda is 100% tied into this Web3 future. It's all linked. You will also see something called DAPs, Decentralized Applications. These are open sourced apps created with smart contracts and executed on the blockchain. DAPs brings together multiple smart contracts and adds a user interface, meaning how the person would actually use it on the web. The result from the DAO and the DAPs is a new world of companies and applications that look familiar, but they provide the trust, decentralized, and secure nature of the blockchain. It's how our companies and our apps that we use will appear to us and work on Web3. But I don't want to go too deep and lose you. 
there's just too much to explain in this one video. I'm just giving you a general understanding in case you come across this information. So let me just finish up with Web3 and tie it all together. The key to Web3 is having a wallet. You need a wallet in order for you to use the dApps. MetaMask and Coinbase wallet, this is different from a Coinbase account on a centralized exchange. MetaMask and Coinbase wallet are two popular wallets. These wallets allow you to carry your cryptocurrency around. In our current web, Web 2.0, you only need a browser and apps. But with Web 3, you need the web, which will be more interactive than a simple browser. That's where the metaverse comes in. So you'll need VR headsets and other tools that will help you be on the internet. Like you see Apple about to bring out some VR thing right now. And as well as those tools, you'll also need a wallet. This will be where our money is held and stored. It's a virtual wallet. In our current Web2 world, data is collected and sold to advertisers in order to fund websites and applications. But that world is changing. In the future world of Web3, handing over your name, number, date of birth, and other sensitive information in order for a dApp to trust you is unnecessary because the blockchain has built trust into the system itself. You don't have to worry about trusting the corporations or trusting the entities because the blockchain will be the trusted resource that everyone understands that it cannot be manipulated and so therefore everything should be secure. That will be the basis of thinking in this new world. The idea is that users would reclaim their power and control over their own data. They could possibly move from platform to platform on the internet using a single personalized account rather than having to log into multiple different accounts for each respective company and platform. Like you won't need a different login for YouTube or to Facebook or Instagram with all these different logins. You won't be going on the internet with a whole bunch of different logins and passwords. Everybody on the earth will probably have one identity that they can go online with and you can only access it through your microchip. They haven't said that yet. That's just how I see things going. This is what the metaverse is being built for, though. And in order to transact and buy and sell, you will have to do it through the system because this is what the new system will be based upon. As I just said, people will have one online identity that they're able to use in order to live out their daily lives. And if you're non-compliant or if you break laws or anything else, they can simply lock you out of the system. That's what they don't tell people. You know how they make a system that you can't buy or sell without having a mark? This is that way. You have to understand that this is a completely new system and new world being created. This system does not come about until after the chaos. The system is prepared to implement the new changes, yes, and the people are ready to adopt it, yes, but for full implementation, there must be enough chaos to support a massive change for the whole world to adopt. Now, this is not a hypothetical or far out science fiction. This is all technology that's already here. They're just waiting to roll it out. Let me sum it up how I see the rollout. After the economic currency collapse that will throw the whole world in chaos, after countries are destroyed and populations lost because of the war that will ensue, after people die from famine and the new pestilences, after our systems are made insecure because of cyber attacks, after more judgments happen that they will blame on climate change, after the world has been completely uprooted, a new world government and a new leader will work with the brightest minds all over the world and bring in a plan of peace and security that will bring the world out of the ashes that it came from. And they will fix the problems that brought the world to the division that it's in. This phoenix that rises out of the ashes will be the new world order. The changes implemented will be the great reset. And the leader that solves the problems will be the Antichrist. The system that will be built will be in the metaverse and the whole world will be brought online. The whole world will be able to interact with the beast, the Antichrist. He'll be in the metaverse, and if you want to be a part of his solution, you will accept his mark. That will be the only way you can access this new system, and that will be your only way to buy and sell in this world economy, because they'll be tying your personal identity to the chip, which will make it sound more secure and less hackable and make sure that there's less fraud and everything is secure. Peace and safety. We are all being primed and conditioned to accept this all. All these technologies are built and are ready. The only thing they are waiting for is implementation. And that does not happen until the collapse that we are currently watching happen at this moment really takes hold. 
in the United States stock market, it's the NASDAQ that is collapsing first. All these tech companies are collapsing to reform. And it's only time that will tell what companies will still be around. You have to understand that these people move through a philosophy of order out of chaos. And we are at the doors of the chaos. To prepare and protect yourself, the one thing that you must do is understand how much you have placed yourself into the hands of the system. And how conditioned you are to accept where they are taking things. Very much like when they put out the mandates. People were totally opposed to taking that solution until they tied in a requirement that said you couldn't partake in their system unless you took their solution. And then people started conforming and doing things they were initially against. It's because they never mentally prepared themselves to bow out and not move with the changes. Because when they make these agendas, they make believable stories. So people don't question things that they should absolutely question. You need to be mindful of your interaction online and how dependent you are on the internet. This whole topic is quite deep, I know, and this was only an introduction. Once you enter into the metaverse, this new system, you will be in Satan's world, and Yah, the Most High, will not operate in this world. This is not his creation. Satan has created his own world that he has power and dominion over. Don't ever mistake me and believe that I mean that Satan has more power than Yah there. I'm just saying, if you choose that world, you are choosing to be in Satan's world more than Yah's, and you will be judged in the real world on the day of judgment. In the metaverse video, I close with this reminder, and I will close with it in this video as well, because it is extremely important to understand and apply. I want you to remember what Paul says about the wrath of Yah in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. That's Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 25. It is so important not to be a part of this group that these verses are referring to. Let me explain why. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That's Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. I read this because this is how those that will be living in this virtual world will be looked at in the eyes of our Creator. This is another wake-up for those in Messiah to bring all thoughts captive into the obedience of our Messiah. Use some discernment. Obey and follow the word of Yah and turn away from this world in the direction that it's heading. If the world cared about you, they would be fully informing you and allowing you to make your own educated choice. Instead, it tells you that it's up to you to figure this all out while it slowly steers you and your children right into their agenda. You must be smart and above all, put down all idols and commit to the will of our Father in heaven. Read his word and obey it. Choose his world over the world Satan has created. We are moving towards a new world order, and you have a choice if you accept it or not. 
It is important that you prepare yourself mentally, physically, and above all, spiritually. Serve the Most High and dedicate your life to His will. Your time is almost up. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay, thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like and share this video with others. This is very important to understand. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. Thank you for watching. As always, I would like to thank all those who support and contribute to this ministry. I thank you for your love and your support. They are truly a blessing during these times that we're in. I am thankful that you are blessed by this ministry, and I thank you for following Yah's call on your heart. Okay, thanks again for watching, everyone. I love you all.